So last week we talked um, about how, among other things, Matthew in the beginning of the book kind of says some things that are showing that Jesus is God. There's other things that he's doing in the first chapter, but a couple of the things I mentioned, first of all, he's conceived like by a, a virgin and the Holy Spirit, so that's, that's a good sign of somebody that's divine. Um, that doesn't usually happen. Um, secondly, it, it, it says he will save his people from their sins, talking about Jesus' name, and only God can save people from sin, so I think there's a claim of deity there. And then he's another, what people are going to call him is Emmanuel, God with us. So it's like, okay, there's like at least Matthew is saying Jesus is, is divine or he's God. But we're going to focus on a little bit different attribute of, of who Jesus is in chapter 2. What I want to do first is, is look through, kind of work through the story. There's not a ton to explain. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll explain some different things, try to help, help us just understand what's kind of going on here in the, in the narrative. And then we'll go back and say, hey, what's some, some of the significance in our lives? Like, what can we take away from it? So um, this is like Christmas story, like the end of the Christmas story, right? And it's 75 degrees outside, which is cool. Probably more likely that this was happening around this time than December 25th, but that's another, <laughs> another story. Um, so let's just, we'll start looking at it. Matthew 2, I'll read the first three verses. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. So a couple notes just on those first three verses. First of all, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is known as the city of David because that's where David was born. We talked last week or two weeks ago, the esteemed like king of Israel that everybody loves, King David. This is the city that he was born in. And Jesus just happens to be born there as well. Happens. Um, and a, a note on, it says the wise men. Now, some of your Bibles may say magi or I don't think it says kings, but maybe, maybe they do. Like traditionally, like you hear we three kings, like that's the song or whatever. And, um, but you may or may not know this, probably not kings and probably not three of them. Like there, there is a, a group of wise men. That's a good way to explain what they were. And best, best I can explain it is they're, they're like the, the philosophers of the day. They're, um, they're, they're wise men, respected guys. They uh, probably come from Persia or Babylon, somewhere far from the east, like it says here in the story. And um, they would look like look to the stars like astronomy and kind of study the stars. And they were also probably involved in astrology and try, like trying to read hey, what, what are the stars saying maybe. And there's um, there's some signs that maybe they're involved in like some sorcery and magic and things. Basically, what I'm trying to say is these aren't like your you're just some like Jewish teachers coming to Jerusalem. These are probably very pagan guys that are that are that see this star and they're coming to find uh, Jesus. Magi is where we get there's part of the word magic or magician. Oh. Um, <laughs> so and, and then Herod. It talks about Herod, right? Now there's if you know like history, there's there's different Herods. This Herod that we're talking about in chapter two is Herod the Great. You may have heard Herod the Great. Um, and he was called Herod the Great, but wasn't so great of a guy. Like he was known for just being kind of ruthless and crazy. And um, and he had some really great building projects. Like he helped to uh, the the temple in Jerusalem. He kind of expanded that. And even like there's some remnants left of Herod's temple in Jerusalem. If you go there today, part of like the western of the Wailing Wall. That's um, part the part of that is Herod's temple. And, um, so, he, so he did some good building projects, but besides that, like Herod was known for being um, like paranoid, not just for, like a biblical account, but Josephus, other writers, that he was known for being paranoid, like people were going to, um, specifically about his own power, like his power as the, the king of the area. He was always concerned, especially later on in life, that somebody's going to 
usurp his throne and somebody's going to like rise to power and the people are going to choose this other king over him or whatever like he was he was like almost to the point of like it, some people think he's like sick like he had, he had this mental illness this this paranoia this so much so that in sometime in his reign he would he would actually kill off people like like close associates in his kind of administration who like were kind of becoming popular racing to power like he killed them so they couldn't take his place. He killed two of his sons because he was concerned that that was going to take place. He killed a wife because for whatever reason she was a threat to his power. So this is like, this is Herod the Great, right? Just not so great. Um, and Herod's title, I don't know if you know this, but like the, the title given to him by Caesar Augustus, I think, um, was King of the Jews. Okay, so um, he was definitely like the king over this area in Judea, but he was like, that was one of the titles that he would go by, king of the Jews. Like I hear as a, as a longtime Christian, I hear king of the Jews and I immediately go to Jesus, but like that was, that was a title of Herod's as well. Um, and so you can imagine like it, you have this paranoid guy and, and these, these wise guys come into town, these, these philosophers from afar and they're searching for it. It says, to, where is he who has been born king of the Jews. And so then he, it says, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, right? And so you can see why he's especially troubled. He's, he's just kind of, well, who's this king? I'm king of the Jews, right? Um, and even like the way that this sentence is constructed, I guess, in the Greek, like there's emphasis when the wise men say, where is he who has been born a king of the Jews? Like it's he, like, where is the, it's almost like they're saying, where's the rightful mm -hmm. king of the Jews? Like, I know that you were kind of put into place and whatever, and you're the acting, but where, where's the one who's been born into that role? This one from, like we looked at two weeks ago, like from this, this kingly line that um, we saw comes all the way down through Joseph, Jesus' legal father. And so, like, y you can just see why, why Herod is, is stirred up in that. Um, and not to mention that, but Herod knows um, he was he was a um, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Herod associates King of the Jews with Messiah because in a little bit he's going to say he calls the chief priests and scribes and he says, "So where is the Christ to be born or the Messiah to be born?" So he's putting the King of the Jews and Messiah together. Well, Messiah is who the Jews, who he was the kind of the king over was who they have been anticipating for hundreds of years, right? So guys walking to town, where's the king of the Jews? Herod's freaking out. Like it's just adding to his paranoia. And this is like, okay. So, and it says all of Jerusalem was troubled. Well, I don't know exactly why all of Jerusalem was troubled, but one reason is probably because they know, like the wise men come in and say this, oh, like this, do you know what a freak Herod is? Like right. he, something's gonna happen. Like this guy, he kills people when he's afraid that they're gonna, so maybe that had to do with their trouble. Um, another interesting note, I don't know if you knew this, but Herod, like he considered himself a Jew. Like he wasn't like, um, like Pontius Pilate. Like Herod was, he tried to prove, even though it wasn't the case, but he, he tried to prove in his family tree and kind of finagle things around a little bit. See, I'm, see, I'm really, a Jew, and he, he was raised as a Jew in his family, so he's, he's like this Jewish uh, guy, and so we won't go into it right now, but it becomes important later on in the book, we'll see this. Even right here in the second chapter, these magi, wise men from afar, Gentiles, are coming to worship Jesus, and this Jew, Herod, <coughs> is, it is rejecting Jesus' king. You're saying, I don't, I don't want to have Jesus as king. So later on, as we go through the book, we're going to see more Gentiles, and this is a, a new thing, more non-Jews coming to, to believe and, and follow Jesus. And we're going to see some Jews reject who Jesus is as king. And that's a significant like move in, in the course of kind of the whole story of God, and it becomes important. We'll talk about it more later, but I want to at least point it out now. So, verse 4, let's go. And assembling, so Herod's troubled. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem in Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, 
And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent to Bethlehem saying, he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. And after listening to the king, they went on their way. So a couple of notes on that. So, so Herod gathers the, the chief priests and scribes together, some of many of whom he probably had appointed into that role. Um, the religious leaders of the time, this says chief priests and scribes. There's others that we'll see throughout the book. There's Pharisees, Sadducees, teachers of the law, the Sanhedrin, like all these different terms. And it can get confusing. And um, it's when it, it is helpful to an understanding of what's going on, we'll take the time to explain that. For now, like generally, the chief priests, the ones who are performing like ritual cultic practices in the temple were, were Sadducees, by and large. And the, the ones who are responsible for teaching and, and, and transcribe, or like writing out and carrying on the word of God, were the Pharisees. So if you see, so this is the chief priests and the scribes that um, Herod kind of gathers together, probably some Sadducees and some Pharisees. So maybe that means something to you, maybe it doesn't, but that's just kind of a, a, a simple way that, that generally the Sadducees were doing priestly duties and Pharisees were doing like, like teaching and scribes and that sort of duty. Um, so, so he asks them, hey, where is Messiah to be born or where is Christ to be born? And they, without hesitation, I, I mean, it doesn't seem like there's any hesitation. They say, in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written, and then they quote this prophecy from, what is it? It's Micah 5.2, um, which is interesting to me because, like, to some extent, this tells me they, like, when God gives us prophecy, and Randy would attest to this, he studies it a lot, like there's, it's not all, uh, we, we have no idea what it's talking about until it happens. Like they're, they're expecting, like based on what this prophet Micah said, they're saying, oh, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. That's what the prophet, like they, they understand the prophecy and that's, that's what they're expecting. Um, so much so that like, um, I keep wanting to say Caesar, Herod, like, he kind of puts them aside and he calls the Magi to himself and kind of secretly asks them, hey, when you go to Bethlehem, you know, kind of tell me when you found him, report to me kind of where he is, that sort of thing. And like, why is he doing that in secret? Like, why, why wouldn't he want just to know, hey, we're gonna go and see if this is really the, the Messiah, like where is the Messiah? Like, why, why wouldn't he open up and do that? Like he, he would be concerned, though this probably wouldn't have been the case, but if they had, like publicly do this search, oh yes, this is one who has been born in Bethlehem, and maybe there's other prophecies that he, like Herod wants to keep that to himself and quickly take care of the problem, we'll see. Like he, he don't want people to get riled up about this new king of the Jews or whatever, he's just, um, let's, let's, let's quickly do something about this. And so he gathers from the wise men, when did the star appear? And he's kind of, yeah, okay, so this is probably about Jesus' age, maybe he's, two years old, or a little less than two years old, whatever it is. So verse 9, after listening to the king, the Magi went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh, which are gifts that you give to important, valuable people, king, like royalty type gifts, expensive, valuable gifts to give to him. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by the way. So they literally have to go like around Jerusalem. They're kind of on the other side of it in Bethlehem. They, they are warned in a dream. They go back to Persia or where they came from. Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. 
and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I call my son. So there's another prophecy that is being fulfilled here. Um, Egypt in the Bible sometimes is like is a place that we that we celebrate and say, oh, they're great, and other times it's not a place that we celebrate. Like, but there's several instances in the Old Testament actually where people in Israel would flee to Egypt to get away from whatever's going on in Israel before returning back to the land. So in this case, that's kind of what is is going on with Jesus and his family go Egypt. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that means he lived part of his life in Egypt then. Yeah, a little yeah, a little while he's in Egypt, so. Um, so, and you've been in Egypt, so you can like walk where Jesus walked yeah. in Egypt, maybe. Um, <laughs> or at least where Mary walked holding him. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Keep it real. Um, so, is he trying to, are they trying to tell him to go away because they're afraid Herod would kill him? Exactly. So, Joseph is warned by an angel. He said, don't, you, you can't stick around here, you need to flee to Egypt. And um, so Joseph and his family does, until Herod dies. And then, then, so now we read on. So verse 16, then Herod's kind of backing up a minute. Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. This was then then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, which is a city close to Bethlehem, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Rachel, um, not only here but in in the the prophet Jeremiah kind of uses this name Rachel kind of to summarize hey, all of all of the women of Israel. It's kind of um, symbolic or poetic of that. So uh, another prophecy, uh, Matthew says, hey, this is what was fulfilled in Jesus, um, in, or in, in the killing of all these young boys in Bethlehem by Herod. Um, and Rachel also was buried near Bethlehem. This is just another there's a connection there. So read on a little bit. But when Herod died, Behold, an angel of the Lord, again, like Joseph is like visited by angels a lot, appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. So there's, sorry, what you were kind of asking. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, which Archelaus is also known as Herod Archelaus, so don't get confused if you're reading history books. He heard that Archelaus was right, and he was just kind of cray-cray, just like, uh, <laughs> like Herod the Great. He was afraid to go there, and being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. So he goes from Egypt, which is south, and he, he doesn't go to Jerusalem, but he goes around Jerusalem to get to Galilee, which is north of Jerusalem, uh, because he was warned in a dream that he should not go to Jerusalem or go to Judea. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled. <coughs> he shall be called a Nazarene. Now, um, quick historical note, if you're keeping track of Herod's. So Herod the Great was at the beginning of this. He's the one that um, did was paranoid didn't want Jesus to be found out as king and orders the killing of his. his He has several sons, one of which is Herod Archelaus, which took over his area of uh, Judea and some other areas, but he kind of becomes the, the tetrarch, I think they call it, of that area. Another son, Herod uh, Antipas, becomes the kind of tetrarch kingish of um, of Judea, where they actually end up going, where Nazareth, or not of Judea, of Galilee, where they end up going, where Jesus spends a lot of his life grow, grown up in the city of Nazareth. Um, he has another son, Philip, who's also the tetrarch of another area. So there's there's multiple guys. The, the one in Galilee, where they're headed to right now in the story, he's the one that 
uh, kills John the Baptist. He's the one that Jesus has put before um, kind of in the whole trial situation. So just to um, try to keep those guys uh, straight. So all of them were crazy. <laughs> uh, probably in their own, or known for different things. I think Herod Antipas, like up further north, he was a little more of just a, a pleasure seeker. I don't know that he was so violent, but um, they all kind of are known for their own thing. But they're they're like kind of they're kingly people, and so they can just kind of do what they want. So. Um, uh, interesting, but one thing that, that throws people off a lot of times with the very last sentence here, um, <clears throat> most of the prophecies that we'll see in Matthew, if probably your Bible has this little like italicized letter next to it that shows in the footnotes where that prophecy came from, like if it came from Jeremiah or Isaiah, like where, where, it got, where it's being referenced from. Well, this one, he shall be called a Nazarene, it, there's no, like, at least my Bible doesn't have any, like, footnote for that. And the reason is, there you can't find a chapter and verse in the Old Testament that says, he shall be called a Nazarene. So, uh-oh, like, what does that mean? Do, are we missing, like, some of the prophecies, or, like, what's going on there? Um, and I think the, the explanation that, that I think makes the most sense and, and, and seems at least most accurate to me in that is, is this. There are numerous prophetic sayings in the Old Testament that we could go to. I can give you a list in Psalms and Isaiah and Daniel of the type of person that, that the Messiah was going to be, speaking of somebody who's kind of lowly and kind of a nobody and somebody who was kind of despised and, pe and people, it, he wasn't anything, we, it seems like anything physically, like he wasn't just this super strapping handsome man or whatever. So kind of he's, he's, a, he's this average Joe, right? And in the day, this city, Nazareth, is like this small, lowly, insignificant city. And kind of a slang term, it seems, for somebody who's just low and a nobody is a Nazarene. Okay? So like we would say, uh, it's to fulfill what we would summarize, what the prophet said that Jesus is going to be an average Joe. That's what we'd say. Well, they'd say, it's to fulfill what the prophet said, like summarizing many of what the prophet said. He shall be called a Nazarene. Like a, he's insignificant, low, but like this is the fulfillment of that prophecy. Um, there's, maybe there's other explanations that you've heard for that, but I, that makes, I, in, in my study, that seemed to make the, the most sense, but I don't want to come down dogmatically on that. Um, so like that's the, that's the text right there, and we're going to talk about some of the um, significance of that, but do you all have questions on just like, so what's going on here? I know the story is familiar, but maybe there's like details or like, is there any um, just questions about the story in general? Um, this, what I said at the beginning, like last two weeks ago, we talked about how Jesus is, um, among other things, he's the son of God, he's, he's divine. Um, but in this chapter, like, who does it say, who are the wise men, who are the magi looking for? Who does it say they're looking for? Verse 2. The Messiah. They're looking for king, the king of the Jews. Of the Jews. Yeah, the king. They're looking for a king. Um, and so we talked about how, how Jesus is God. We talked a little bit about two weeks ago how Matthew's even showing how Jesus has some, some um, right to the throne of David um, as a king. But this section, chapter 2, really expands this idea of Jesus being king, um, king of the Jews. And even in the first couple of verses, it doesn't just say Herod. It says Herod the king, Herod the king. And they're looking for the king of the Jews, Jesus. And so it's king, king, king. Something's going on with king here. So what I kind of notice as I look through this, and I think it's helpful to kind of consider, is like the very different responses that people have to Jesus. Um, like opposite responses that people have to Jesus. Um, first, the Magi, the wise men's response. We don't know how far away these guys came from. Certainly a couple weeks, probably a few months, probably over a year. Like they're traveling a long time to find uh, the king of the Jews. And their, uh, their response to this king 
um, like emotionally what's going on is shown in verse 10. It says, they were, when they saw the star, like the star is now not just maybe over, over Judea, but the star is like actually leading them to the, to the place, the house that Jesus is in. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. It's like he could have just said, oh, and they were happy. But he, but he, and he could have said, they, they, when they saw the star, they had great joy. Or when they saw the star, they rejoiced with great joy. It says, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Like, it's not, it's not like, eh, that's cool, all right, like, high five. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, it's, and, and even in the, um, like, this is our English translation, but even in the Greek, there's four different words, unique words that are described, not unique, but four words describing that rejoicing that they were doing. Like, it's, it's significant. They're like, they're pumped. They're rejoicing at um, finding out where this king was. And then, so that's kind of their, maybe their emotional response. But then what's the action that they take? Verse 11 says, um, going into the house, they saw the child with Mary's mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Now, probably, like, worship, probably they're bowing, like, they, their faces are probably on the ground. Like they're they're and and this isn't just three guys. Remember, it's probably more than three guys. And so it's this group of grown men, like falling on their faces, probably like bowing down before a one and a half year old, uh, you know, <laughs> learning to walk or whatever. Yeah. Like it's it's kind of like shocking to think about. Like it's um and. and, and like weird, like oh my gosh, like I think about worshiping Jesus as a man or worshiping God, and, you know. But this is like, this is a significant, strong emotional and and physical active response to who this person is. They're bowing down before him, rejoicing exceedingly that they found him, and and they give these expensive gifts, like to say, hey, you're like to. To, to be with you in your presence is more like it's more valuable than this gold and this, these incenses that we have. And like there, there's worship of of Jesus going on here, great joy and worship. And then the quite opposite response to that is Herod. Herod's emotions that he feels in this it says in verse three, when the wise men come looking for the king of the Jews. Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. I'll say he was troubled, like he worked some pretty startling stuff. He was troubled, and then when the wise men kind of decide not to report back to Herod and go back to where he came from, it says in uh, verse 16, when Herod saw that he'd been tricked by the wise men, he became furious. So this is an opposite, or I don't know if it's opposite, but it's quite a different emotional like response to King Jesus. And his response isn't to worship him, but Herod's response is what? Kill him. Yeah. So um, so you see these like opposite reactions. Great joy and worship of him as king, or troubled and furious and eliminate him, like get him out of the picture. And remember, like we, like we could say, Jesus is God. So, so Herod wasn't only rejecting the authority of Jesus, the man, but of God. And he's not the first one to do that, right? We have like our human history. We have a long history of, of rejecting the authority of God and not wanting God to, like denying God's place of, of king of our lives, Jesus' place of king of our lives. Like, so Genesis chapter three, right? The serpent tells Eve, hey, you're not going to die if you eat of the tree that God said not to of knowledge of good and evil. God knows that when you eat of that tree, you're going to be like him. And so what does Eve do and Adam do? They say, God, I don't want you in this in this position of authority. Like, I'm going to kind of step up there with you. Like, say, I, I've got this. I want, to, I want to take this on myself. And the result of that is is death. I mean, again, that continues on in mankind. Israel in the Old Testament. There's a time, we read about it in 1 Samuel, a time when God was ruling his people, Israel. It was a theocracy. And they 
demand a king. We want to be like all the other nations that have a king. We want to be ruled by like a man. We don't want to. And it, it seems innocent enough, except like when you see what the Lord says to to through Samuel to the people, like it's no. He, he warns them in First Samuel nine, like don't. This is not what you want. These kings, they're they're not going to be what you think. They're going to let you down. This this is going to lead to no good. This king, this is not what you want. Even like in um, in the first king's inauguration, when Saul's kind of being put in position, um, Samuel tells the people, today you have rejected your God who saves you from all your calamities and your distresses, and you have said to him, set a king over us. So again, that's just like we see through history. And, and later on in this story, read about in the book of, in the Gospel of John, um, Jesus, like Pilate has Jesus up in front of the people and he says, Shall I crucify your king? And they say what? They say, we have no king but Caesar. Like, we don't want that guy as king. We, like, Caesar is our king. We just, we, we know that we don't want it to be that man. And so the reality is, like, this power-crazed Herod, this, like, crazy murdering dude, he wasn't the only one who sought the removal of the, the rightful king, the rightful one to the throne. And the reality is, since Adam and Eve, all of us in our own way have done something similar in rejecting the authority of Jesus at times in our lives. Paul, in the book of Romans, he kind of gives, right at the beginning, he gives kind of a little uh, snapshot of some of mankind. Here's how he describes a little bit about what's going on with mankind. He says, what can be known about God is plain to them, and then say to us, because God has shown it to them. For God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. We can see God, we can see his power, like he's revealed himself to us just in, in creation alone and what we can see. So we're, they are without excuse, for all they, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. And it goes on to say they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and they worshiped the creature rather than the creator. So again, it's just like this is, this is the story of, of mankind saying, in, 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 in sin, saying we don't want the one who, who has the right to rule. We've in, in, um, we have rejected him as king. And so there's really, there's two types of people now. And remember I said, I don't know if you remember, two weeks ago, I kind of said um, in the book of Matthew, Jesus says things that are very polarizing. Like it's, you're this or you're this. Um, and the, there's, there's several different ways that, that he talks about that. And there's, just, there's not like middle ground on these things. So I'd say, like, there's two types of people, just to, I don't want to, like, over-spiritualize what's going on in, in Matthew chapter 2, but um, there are some people, uh, I think many of us here, who, although we were born into this power, authority, thirsty um, flesh, God has made us alive um, in faith, and we have recognized Jesus as king. And we don't live perfectly under the, the kingship of Jesus. We, we, we don't live like as, as perfect citizens with, with Christ uh, ruling over us. But we, we have made this, we have this understanding. Yet uh, at, at some point in our lives, we said, man, I, yeah, yeah, Jesus, he is God. He is king. I, I need to submit my life to him. I need to worship him. I need to serve him. And... Um, so if that's you, if you've had that like realization, understanding, you believe that, and my, my encouragement to you, my exhortation tonight is stop trying to be king. Because we all, we all like, like God to, we like Jesus to, to be the king in, in some areas of our life, and we don't like him to be the king in other areas of our life. Um, and so I'd say, be, be like the Magi and say, I'm going to travel however far it takes, and I'm going to bow down, and I'm going to worship this person who I, who I, I believe is 
is who the prophet said who he who he's revealed himself to be and i'm gonna i, I give up like he, he's worth gold and whatever i can bring to him he's worth those things and treat him as king in all areas of your life so that's the first type of person the second type of person is the one who still says no i'm, I'm rejecting jesus as king i just i don't believe that he is with with the way that I live in my heart, I just, I just, I just don't believe that's him. And if that's you, then I, my prayer is that as we go through the book of Matthew, like we'll see a little bit more about who Jesus is, and actually believe, hey, this guy is the king that will take the time to step off, you know, kind of ruling our own life and thinking, well, this is, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna be in control, and just give that over to the one who is, who's the rightful heir to the throne. So. Um, so you, I, I see as I like read chapter two of Matthew, you, you kind of have two options. They seem really extreme, but I think Matthew's doing this on purpose. You have the option of of recognizing Jesus for who he is and rejoicing exceedingly with great joy that you have found him and you come to him and you bow down and you worship him. And there's ways that we do that with our life by living according to his word and offering our lives up as a, as a sacrifice of praise to him. Um, or uh, you can try to kind of maintain your position on the throne. But in order to do that, remember, like what we're seeing here in the story, like Jesus is the rightful heir to the throne. So you can try to like keep yourself in that position as much as you can. But eventually you've got to do something with Jesus. Like he's, he's, he's supposed to be in that position of authority and rulership. And so somehow you're going to have to like knock him out of there. Herod's decision was, I, I just need to kill him. He didn't get the chance to do it later on. Others decide and are successful in it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll end with this. Um, there was there was a sign above Jesus' name when he was crucified on the cross, mm -hmm. and it's. Do you remember what it said? It said, "This is Jesus, King, the King of the Jews. Jews," and it's written in three languages, so that so everybody can read this. This is Jesus, King of the Jews, which I think is it's the most maybe ironic statement ever written down because though Jesus is dying on a cross and they're making they're trying to make fun of him by making this statement it's a true statement he is king of the Jews only not only that but the sign could have also said king of Herod the Great it could have said king of of Pilate and king of all Rome and it could have said this is Jesus. This is the king of the soldiers who are gambling for Jesus' garments at the cross. These, this is the king. This is Jesus, king of these people who are spitting upon Jesus and, and mocking him as he's on the cross. This is the king of, of, of all. This is the king of you. This is the king of Joelissa. It's the king of Shalari. It's the king of Emily. It's the king of Saudi. It's the king of all. That's what the sign could have said. And, and ironically, they were using it to... Um, to, to mock Jesus. But one day, Jesus will return again. There's, there's other prophecies that have yet to be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And there's, um, which I believe that they're going to happen. We've, we've seen, we're beginning to see even in Matthew and plenty of places studying scripture where somebody says this on behalf of the Lord and it takes place. Well, there's a prophecy that we have in the end of our Bible about, uh, in a few places, but the one I'll read is um, in Revelation. 19, which talks about how this Jesus is going to return, or his returning is going to look a little bit different. And this is what it's going to look like. Um, Revelation 19.11 it says this. So I'll just end by reading this passage. Um, this is John, another one of Jesus' followers. Um, he has a vision uh, from the Lord, and this is one of the things that he sees. I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and one sitting on it, the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword 
with which to strike down the nations who are against him, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And listen to this, verse 16. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is how Jesus reveals himself in the end. And there will be no question to it at this point. And so, Jesus, who is Jesus? That's one of the questions that we're asking ourselves in the study. He's God, and he is king, and he's a good king. And what should our response, what should it be to him? Worship of him, submitting our lives to him. Let me pray, and then I'll ask a couple kind of discussion questions. Um, God, I believe that you um, are divinely orchestrating uh, everything that happens, and it's clear from even as we read this, um, the, the history of the beginnings of Jesus' life, that you are in control of all that happens. And we read like we just read, you even know how the, how the story turns out in the future. I believe that, God, we believe that. And um, I believe you, you have given us the, the, the faith to comprehend that Jesus is the one uh, to rule. Jesus is the king, regardless of all earthly kings and uh, regardless of, of who, who we see as authorities. Um, you are, Jesus is the final ruler over all. And we believe and, and, and proclaim, yes, he is king of kings and lord of lords. And Lord, we want to live our lives in light of that, and I confess that I lose sight of that oftentimes, and and put myself in a position of of deciding things for myself against your will, because in I think that I can do it better, which is ridiculous. <laughs> so God, would you um, would you open my eyes? Would you open our eyes to see how we can rightfully bow our knee to you as as our God and King? And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm.